Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vince, the president of City College of New York, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Professor Sharon Kosloy and Edward Blank Family Distinguished Scientist. This is the fifth year that the, um, the lectureship has taken place at CCNY, um, and it is the premier scientific lecture, um, annual lecture at the college, and, and we're thrilled that you are able to join us today. As you heard in the recorded announcement, I'll repeat it now, um, this lecture is being recorded. So this is your, um, this is your uh, notice of, of, of consent. And then a little bit about um, the lectureship itself and its history at CCNY before asking um, Dean Susan Perkins to introduce our speaker today. The, the lecture is named after um, Professor Sharon Kosloy. Um, who was a beloved member of the biology department at the College of New York for 27 years. Um, she had a distinguished research and publication career, but really when you, when you read about her, her life, one of the things that stands out in everything you read is, is how devoted she was as a mentor and a teacher and a disseminator of knowledge. And, and this thread of her legacy on our campus carries through in the design of um, uh, Mr. Blank and his um, contributions to the college in underwriting very, very generously this annual lecture. Um, um, Ed was um, from the beginning deeply concerned about the dissemination and popularization of scientific knowledge. Knowledge that was not to be reduced or watered down or a way um, um, diminished by its popularization. But, but to make sure that, that, that broad public audience, audiences that belong to this campus and outsiders would have a chance every year to come to this campus and, and, and learn uh, about uh, some cutting edge field in scientific knowledge. Um, and I, I believe last year when I introduced this lecture, I said something similar to that, um, but I have to just take note that we are at a moment when the dissemination of accurate science as a guide, not just to our enlightenment activity and to our safety and the security of our society is, is, is more important and more obviously important probably than ever before. So, so I think, um, Ed, I wanna say that, that as a campus, um, we are, and I, as president, I am personally grateful to your generosity in underwriting this lecture but also in, in, in the real clear vision you had about uh, commemorating um, your wife, uh, Professor Sharon Kosloy, in a way that both um, accurately represented uh, her questions to this institution, but also responded to the needs of our society. So thank you so much for, for your continued um, and I would say extravagant generosity in making this lecture possible. It's my pleasure now to introduce our, our relatively still new um, Dean of Science, Dean Susan Perkins. Dean Perkins came to us from the Museum of Natural History. She is a, 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 a biologist herself, um, a parasitologist, um, specializing in, in uh, various categories of parasites, including the parasite that it causes uh, malaria and so this, the, uh, but also is interested in all sorts of other relevant creatures and their virology like bats and rodents. And um, please welcome Dean Susan Perkins. Thank you, President Boudreau for that introduction. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone as well to our Sharon Kosloy Edward Blank Family Distinguished Lecture here. And maybe I'll take one more moment to remind everybody again that this is recorded. I'll be moderating questions after the lecture. And if you have questions throughout it, use the Q&A function, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, as President Boudreau said, this series honors uh, the late Dr. Sharon Kosloy, who was a beloved colleague in the biology department at City College for 27 years. And I want to also echo the thanks uh, to Ed Blank for his continued very generous support of science at City College, including but not limited to 
the support of the lecture series. So Dr. Kozloy was, like myself, a microbiologist, and microbiologists are inherently multidisciplinary scientists at heart. So our work intersects with core concepts of ecological and evolutionary biology, as well as molecular and cellular biology, but it also intersects with various aspects of chemistry, physics, earth science, and math. And as we scientists face problems of increasing complexity and of increasing urgency, such as climate change, infectious and genetic diseases, and developing robust clean energy solutions, this interdisciplinarity becomes more and more vital. As you are about to see, this year's Cosloy Blank Distinguished Scientist, Dr. Nancy Coppell, is the perfect embodiment of a multidisciplinary scientist as well. She was trained in pure mathematics via a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and then a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. After receiving her degrees, she began to pursue research in applied mathematics and initially her questions centered on pattern formation in chemical systems. However, over the past two decades, Dr. Coppell has immersed herself in the fascinating intersection of mathematics and neuroscience. Her research seeks to break ground in the understanding of cognition, as well as how deviations in brain rhythms may contribute to neurological diseases such as Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and epilepsy. Dr. Gopel is the William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor at Boston University, and she is the co-director for the Center for Computational Neuroscience and Neurotechnology there in Boston. Amongst her many accomplishments, she has been inducted into both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and she has been a recipient of the Sloan Guggenheim and MacArthur Fellowships. Um, thanks to the families of the Coslois and Blanks. I'm delighted to be here with you today, if only virtually, and in these really hard times. Um, I wish you all safety and a lot of joy to help get through it all. So today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, brain rhythms. It's about what brain rhythms are, uh, why they're important in health, and how they change in disease. And along the way, I'm going to tell you about how mathematics and computation play a role in understanding a lot of the issues that come up in all of these themes. So before I can get to, uh, wait, oh good, my laser pointer, good. Before I can get to talking about uh, the signals that are associated with brain rhythms, I'm starting with uh, a much larger theme that's used in many applications that has to do with how one takes arbitrary signals in time and uh, turns it into sums of periodic solutions. So periodic uh, signals. So for example, if we start with a few signs, few sign functions, you all know about that. Um, uh, each of these has a different period t and frequency two pi over t. So these are three different frequencies and we add them up and we throw in some noise and what you see is not periodic at all. And if we had a lot more of those periodic functions and they had more noise and they had um, different amplitudes, you'd get something that didn't look periodic in the least. So the challenge in thinking about brain signals is going in the other direction. It's starting with something that's not periodic and uh, dividing it up into things that are periodic. If we didn't have noise, then the three, um, the three components here would show up as vertical lines in what's called a power spectral density. 
um, because of the fact that we do have noise, these are bumps. There are a lot of issues, mathematical issues in, in estimating power spectral densities, but that's not what I'm going to be focusing on. So now I can tell you about the signals that one actually sees in the brain. There are lots of ways to measure uh, brain signals, which go on all the time, 24 seven. Non-invasively, there's what's called an electroencephalograph. There is um, magnetoencephalograph, which costs a whole lot more money. And the kinds of signals you get from that looks like what I'm pointing to now. It's also possible, mostly in animals, but also in humans that have part of their skull removed, to um, measure deep within brain tissue. And what you get from that is, um, what you get from that uh, is a local field potential which averages electrical signals over a whole lot of cells. I'll talk about this particular signal in the next slide. There's also something called ECOG, where the probe is underneath the skull, but it's on top of the brain. And of course, there are single cell recordings. So again, there are many mathematical issues associated with that, uh, but that's not what I'm gonna be focusing on. But it makes a lot of mathematicians busy. Okay, so now I can start talking to you about what brain rhythms are. Uh, in order to compute these power spectral densities, one has to choose a time over which you, uh, you look at the signals. And if you choose a long enough time, where long enough in this case is maybe a minute or two, one almost always gets what I've drawn here in which the power is very high at low frequencies and low at high frequencies. But if you're looking at a smaller interval, say a second or two, then you start seeing a lot more structure. Uh, and that kind of structure turns up as peaks in the power spectral density. So I've drawn a little picture of it for you here. There's a peak at about 81 hertz. And that's all we mean by a rhythm. It's just a peak in the power spectral density. So um, you can actually see this in, in the signals that the electrodes produce. You can see a slow rhythm and you can see a very fast rhythm. That's the 81 hertz that's riding on top of it. There's also a peak at about four to eight hertz, but that's been cut off. So it's a very squishy sort of idea. Um, it's not very well defined. It's just a peak in this power spectral density. Uh, these rhythms have been looked at for over, for almost a hundred years or so. And when people, first started looking at them, they, they uh, classified them by their frequency, but also by their behavioral state and by the location in the brain where they were seen. So the very first rhythm that people looked at was um, the well-known alpha, which in humans is nine to 11 hertz. It's when, one's eyes are closed and it's seen in the back of the brain. But as people started looking more and more at those things, they found out that actually this is much, much too simple. Uh, that is for the same set of frequencies, you might find this in different locations of the brain. You might find them in different behavioral states. They have different mechanisms that produce them. So although we still use these names, um, we have to be more careful about what we mean when we're talking about any of these rhythms. 
So I just told you that these rhythms aren't very well defined and they're noisy and they're hard to measure. And there are many other things about them that are not so easy to deal with, which raises the question of why should we care about um, these rhythms? And the answer is that there is an immensely strong association between behavior of animals and these rhythms. And they're on the time scale of behavior. So for example, suppose a mouse is running along and gets to a point where he has to decide whether to go one way or whether to go another way. At that point, the rhythms change almost immediately and um, the connections between different parts of the brain also change. So these rhythms are associated with whatever is happening in the task at that moment. And it's not just motor behavior, it's basically everything we think of as being involved with thinking, like sensing, or paying attention or making decisions or doing motor planning, everything we think of as part of cognition um, shows up as changes in rhythms. And interestingly enough, all forms of neurological disease are associated with pathological changes in rhythm. So a big question that one can ask about all of these things is, um, are these rhythms just epiphenomena? Are they the, uh, are, are they something that just happens because we're thinking or are they actually causal for thinking? And my point of view very, very strongly is that um, these rhythms are important for actually producing the cognition. So one reason that for believing that rhythms are important for actually thinking is that they are definitely needed for coordination. And that's part of what I'm going to be telling you about for the rest of the talk. Um, so if there is something like a genetic abnormality that leads to changes in rhythm, it's going to lead to changes in coordination and it's going to form a pathway that can lead to disease. So once one thinks of rhythms as being needed for coordination, it's not so uh, surprising that neurological diseases would be associated with changes in rhythm. And in the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking more about this. One theme that's going to come up is that it's not just the frequencies of the rhythms that matter, but um, the physiology that leads to these rhythms. And for those of you in the audience who are mathematicians, actually there are a whole lot of really good mathematical questions. So the study of rhythms leads us to mathematical questions and it leads us to neuroscience questions. The mathematics follows the neuroscience. So in this talk, I'm going to be addressing the, what I think of as three basic neuroscience questions. One has to do with where do these rhythms come from? What's the underlying physiology that supports them? And that question is very important for understanding how do these rhythms participate in thinking? How do they support thinking? And then finally, I'll talk about how do these rhythms uh, manifest as symptoms in disease? And as you'll see, there's reason to believe that mathematics is central in understanding all of the above. Uh, I've so far been talking to you about macro signals. So macro, by, by macro signals, I mean you're looking at the output of a whole lot of cells at once. But those macro signals come about because um, there are many 
individual neurons that are producing electrical signals. And those individual neurons communicate with one another via what's known as spikes. These are rapid changes in voltage across a neuron. So you think of a neuron as something like an electric circuit and a voltage, a spike is basically a discharge of that circuit. Um, I'm going to tell you later about complicated models, but to get the intuition, here is a really simple model. It's called a leaky integrate and fire, and it gives you a sense of, of how spikes form. The idea is that there's a voltage in this electrical circuit and uh, the voltage increases when there's current that flows into the circuit, but it also leaks out in a way that's proportional to the amount of voltage. So normally the voltage would build up to an asymptote at I, but if there's a threshold below that that leads to spiking, when the voltage gets up to that threshold, it discharges and is reset. And if the current keeps on flowing in, it's going to do this over and over and over again and produce a periodic output. One can make up networks of spikes, now excuse me, networks of um, neurons in which each neuron is integrating and firing. But when any given interneuron, when any given neuron fires, it adds a current to every other neuron that it's attached to. And this current can make the voltage go up or could make the voltage go down. And if that current makes the voltage go up, the synapse is called excitatory. And if it makes the voltage go down, the synapse is called inhibitory. Okay, so this is the most complicated slide I have, and you really don't have to understand it to understand the rest of the talk. What I want to point out is that when pros are looking at um, how neurons spike and how rhythms form, they use what's known as the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, for which Hodgkin and Huxley got a Nobel Prize for the formulation. And it's basically a description of an electric circuit. So there's one set of equations which um, are called Kirchhoff's law, and that's conservation of current. So this term is about the circuit charging up. This is about currents flowing back and forth over a piece of a network, a piece of a neuron. Um, this term is about currents flowing into that piece. And this is about currents coming from synapses. So those are Kirchhoff's laws. And then we also have something which describes each of those currents. Um, in circuit theory, it's called Ohm's law, the famous equals IR. And um, it's solved for I. So we have I is one over the resistance called the conductance and then the electromotive force that's pushing that in, uh, pushing the currents across the, across the piece of membrane. So what makes this really different from what you learn in your first physics course is that this resistance or conductance is not a constant. This M and H are modeling what's known as gates. These gates open and close and they allow currents to come in and go out of the cell. And they do it in a way that depends on the voltage and it has its own time scale, which can itself be dependent on voltage. So we end up with something that has many, 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 many equations, depending on the number of ions. It's highly nonlinear and it has many, 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 many time scales. And so you can imagine that there is a lot of mathematics there in trying to figure it out in how it behaves.
but I'm going to go back to simpler things now. If one is going to have a rhythm, a whole lot of cells have to fire at the same time. They have to be almost synchronized in order to see those macro signals that I was talking about. And that means something has to be able to, um, something has to be able to synchronize them. It turns out there are many different ways that cells get synchronized, but I'm talking to you about one that will show up in the rest of my talk. And I'm illustrating it by showing you um, a simulation in which we have 10 cells and each one of them is periodic. They're not coupled to one another at all. And they're started out as far apart as possible so they're initialized, so their phases are well-spaced with, with respect to one another. And now we give them a pulse of inhibition at time zero. And you'll notice that they come together very quickly. And then when they spike, they spike closer together than they were before. So the reason this happens is that it's in the structure of those equations. The point is that the pulse of inhibition drives all of these cells close to the same point. It's a kind of unstable rest point. And uh, when the inhibition decays enough, they can all start spiking and they're close to one another. So that's how the inhibition happens. I should point out that the inhibition um, takes longer to decay than excitation, and that will play a role in what you'll see in a slide or two. So this is about a bunch of slides that aren't connected to one another, that become synchronous, but the same issue shows up when you have networks of excitatory and inhibitory cells, meaning networks with excitatory synapses or inhibitory synapses. Um, if they're connected to one another, then they have shared inhibition and this mechanism helps them to synchronize. Okay, so I can now tell you about the simplest network. The simplest network has one excitatory cell and one inhibitory cell. And you hook them together and you start getting periodic solutions. Now that isn't surprising because we know that the E cells or the I cells alone can produce periodic solutions. But something else happens when you have excitation and what's known as feedback inhibition. What happens is that the inhibition becomes very important in determining what the period is of the, of the periodic uh, signal. Before, it was just how excited, how much current is flowing into each cell. Now the feedback inhibition turns out to be an important, um, an, an important consideration for where the frequency of the rhythm comes from, and it's the longest time scale. This kind of rhythm is called gamma. It's usually between about 30 and 90 hertz. And um, uh, it can have this variation because the E cells can vary in their excitability. So what I'm leading up to with all of this is being able to talk about function because that's what I'm really interested in. So I'm, I'm getting to what gamma, how is gamma important in function? And I'm gonna start with the idea of a cell assembly. All I mean by a cell assembly is that it's a collection of neurons that's almost synchronous for a shortish period of time, which could be just a few cycles of, of um, say, gamma. And uh, these cell assemblies are important because they tag a group of cells that are working together. And because they're synchronous, they have a stronger effect downstream. So this gamma rhythm I've been telling you about 
is associated with forming cell assemblies. There are experimental papers that show that. And there are other experimental papers that show that they show up every time you have groups of cells that have to be working together. And that's in, for example, sensory processing. It's in attention. You need to be talking about specific sets of cells, not just the whole brain. And so attention, learning, memory all involve specific sets of cells which form cell assemblies. What's really not obvious at all and where both physiology and modeling come in is why should these cell assemblies have anything to do with gamma? It's not at all straightforward. So I'm going to show you in the next, um, in this slide here, why gamma turns out to be really good for creating cell assemblies. And I'm gonna illustrate it with this simulation here. So now we have a large network. We have um, 1,200 cells. There are 200 I cells. There are 1,000 E cells. And uh, we're focusing on the yellow part. I'll get to the white part after. Uh, the cell assembly is going to be these 600 E cells and 400 E cells are going to be suppressed. And the simulation will give you a sense of why that happens. So uh, we start with these 1,000 E cells, and they have a slight gradient in the currents coming into them so that um, if they were not connected, which they are all to all, uh, the one marked 1,000 would fire first, and the others would come along. And at some point, enough of these fire to create enough excitation from all of the E cells that the I cells will fire. The I cell fires and it goes back to all of the E cells and it suppresses the other 400. Um, now, this is only the first time through, so why does it continue? The idea is that the next time the inhibition is over, the input is still coming in. It's going to do exactly what it did before. And when 600 cells fire, the I cells will co come on and get rid of the rest. And so we have a cell assembly going on as long as the input is coming in. Um, it's important that there's no memory from cycle to cycle because once the inhibition wears off, there's no longer time scales. And the suppression is coming from the timing of the excitation and the inhibition um, um, and can be moved around by changing parameters. What the rest of the white is showing is that if you had currents in there that last longer than the inhibition, uh, they would create memory and the cell assembly would be gone. Um, it might look like there's some structure here, but you put in a little noise and it all disappears and this is rock solid. So this is an important example of how physiology matters for function. What's making this work is that there's feedback inhibition. If you didn't have this, you wouldn't create the cell assemblies. And I want to give you another example of um, how gamma is important in um, in uh, um, how, how uh, frequencies support cognition. And this example is coming in for function. So this example is coming from a, the attention literature. There, there are many papers, I've mentioned some people here, that shows that cells that are coding for um, attended objects or attended places tend to be uh, give have more coherent input and this input is coming in likely as gamma rhythms. Uh, what I'm going to show you is why those are good for locking out the ones that are less synchronous, less coherent. 
Okay. Uh, so this particular simulation uses a very simple network. Again, it has just one E-cell and one I-cell. And we're going to think about what happens when this network is getting two different inputs, one of which is associated with attention and one of which isn't. So the very first input is um, a coherent gamma that shows up as spikes in the current it's, uh, or, or spiky sort of um, inputs here. And there's absolutely no second input. And what we see is that uh, it's no surprise that if you get a strong gamma input, you're going to get a strong gamma output here. And so you can see with the E, e, e and I cells that you get the same, you get the strong gamma output. And now we're going to take the same input for input A, and, but add an input B, which is not as coherent. So the oscillations are not as spiky. Um, the average current is the same. What's surprising about this is that the output of it is identical to the output when this wasn't here. In other words, um, these have been essentially filtered out. Um, it turns out that if this second input is waving its hands and screaming, it will be noticed and it will come up in the output. But all you have to do to shut this one up is to increase the feedback inhibition. So we have a mechanism from the physiology that enables us not only to form cell assemblies, but to lock out things that should not be part of the cell assemblies. OK, this is what I think of as a tip of the iceberg for all of the, uh, the ways rhythms are used in the nervous system. And I think that this, uh, uh, this slide, which comes from a paper by the Palvas and others, uh, illustrates how important rhythms are to coordination. So uh, what you see here is these two halves of the brain. The colors can be ignored because they, they just correspond to different lobes of the brain. But what's important to notice is all the lines between different parts of the brain that talk about, that, that are um, measuring how much different parts of the brain are coordinated with one another, are coherent with one another, and coherent in different frequencies. So the authors chose to measure at least three different frequency ranges, alpha, beta, and gamma. You see that there are different, um, different subgroups of areas that are coordinated in these, you can think of them as three different languages. And, and the things that are most interesting here is the fact that um, there's a huge amount of real estate, of, of brain real estate that is involved in um, coordinating different parts of the brain by different, different um, three different rhythms. So to me, what this slide is saying is it's really important not only to know what's known as the connectome, which is the ways all the different parts of the brain are, are connected, what the wires are, but you need to know what goes along those wires. You need to know what the signals are, how they're coordinate, how they're talking with one another, um, how they depend on tasks, how they depend on context for the tasks. So this is what I call the dynome. It's much more complicated than the connectome. Um, People have just really started to put all of this information together. But I believe that to really understand how the brain works, we're going to, we're going to need to understand much more deeply than we do now 
how all the dynamics of the brain play a role in all of the necessary coordination in the brain. Okay, I can now start talking to you about, um, about diseases. And I'm gonna start with Parkinson's disease because it's so connected with dynamics. Parkinson's disease involves a loss of dopamine in the basal ganglia. Um, that, so the, this whole thing is called the basal ganglia. And when that dopamine gets lower, it leads to an increase in beta power that's um, say eight to 30 Hertz or so. And it goes all the way around this cortical basal ganglia loop. So the beta is important because it's directly correlated with all of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, especially bradykinesia, which is inability to move fluently. Many of you have seen people with Parkinson's disease shuffle and, and be unable to move quickly. And rigidity, which is unable to start movements at all. Uh, what's very interesting to me and many other people about Parkinson's disease is that it's a kind of dynamical disease in that anything that will get rid of the beta will actually help with the bradykinesia and the rigidity. So a spectacular example of this is deep brain stimulation where the subject is implanted with a stimulator um, at one part, it's here, the subthalamic nucleus of this whole loop. And um, once the stimulator is turned on, within about three seconds or so, a person who has been shuffling along can move fluent, fluently and do everything that's, that's normal. So, um, nothing has happened in those three seconds that, that dealt with all of the degeneration that led to the Parkinson's disease, but simply by, by changing the rhythms, one relieves the motor symptoms. So that means it makes it important to understand where the beta comes from. So my group's been involved in doing that. Um, there were previous theories about where that beta comes from that involved this part of the loop. It's called the indirect pathway. Um, there are other people who think that the pathological aspects of beta come from the cortex, which does indeed um, go to the STN. So uh, we suggested, we use modeling to suggest a new idea which is that it comes from the striatum, which uh, makes sense to us because the loss of dopamine comes from this little creature here. And um, so the striatum is the first part of this whole loop that, uh, that feels the loss of the dopamine. So I want to tell you about this model. Uh, so this model was done by Michelle McCarthy of my group, and it uses the properties of the neurons that are involved in the striatum. Each of these things have only one kind of cell in it. They're known as medium spiny neurons also. Um, they're the only output cells for for the, uh, the striatum, so they're really important. Whatever they do is heard throughout the whole loop. And we look at half of them, the so-called D2 cells, um, which are ones that project to the cells I mentioned before in the indirect pathway. So these cells have the property that if the dopamine level goes down, those cells become more excited. And they also indirectly lead to acetylcholine going up, something that will be important on the next slide. 
So here's a model of a whole bunch of cells. They're all inhibitory. They're all connected to one another and they're not spiking very much. Now we're going to add some excitability and suddenly they start they start firing much more, which is not surprising. I mean, if you make the cells more excitable, they want to fire more, and these do. So the, the rates go up. What is surprising is you can, you can see in various places a lot of rhythmicity. So the amount of beta in this output here goes up. By the way, this is time. This is um, um, the cell number. So we're looking at what's called a rastogram. I, we, you've seen some rastograms on earlier slides. I just forgot to mention the name of it. So the question here is, where does that beta come from? Why is it beta? Why is there rhythms at all? And what the model shows is that the rhythm is induced by an interaction of the inhibition that we know we have and even more of it and a funny current called the M current. The M current is, is recalcitrant. The M current is, is a current that will try to oppose anything that uh, an outward um, input tries to impose on the cell. So if you give the cell inhibition, the M current changes so that it drives the voltage closer to spiking after a while. So if you have um, a, a pulse of inhibition, it will make the voltage go down and then return. But if there's enough excitation that's in the cell, it goes down, the M current creates enough extra and a rebound spike occurs. And the timing of all of this turns out to give a rebound that's associated with beta rhythms. So I'm saying all of this because I want to lead into a very general issue, which has to do with um, the sociology of science. So even the best of, even the best of models don't prove anything. At best, what they can do is introduce new ideas and these they can make these ideas plausible, but um, every modeler wants to find experimentalists who will work with them to try to figure out if these ideas are even close to right. So we shopped this around with various people and they all told us it couldn't possibly work this way. And they gave us reasons, and the reasons just didn't sound, they didn't sound right enough to us. So we kept going. And one day we were talking to some postdoc um, who said, oh, I can, I can test this. This was Shua Han, who's now become a very well-known scientist. And so she had a few extra mice laying around, and so she, she tested it. And the idea was, as I told you, if dopamine goes down in indirect ways, it makes acetylcholine go up. And so she arranged an experiment in which she could inject um, not acetylcholine, but something that makes acetylcholine work better, um, an agonist, a so-called agonist of acetylcholine, into the striatum and nowhere else. And our, our um, predictions were, you should see that that should make the whole network um, produce beta oscillations. So um, this is what's known as a spectrogram. This is time, this is frequency, and the color here gives you the amount of power the amount of, of energy there is in these different frequencies. And since the colors are not bright, you'll see that not much is going on here. 
Now we add the carbocol and you see that the electrical signals are producing beta like crazy. So, and you see it also in the spectrogram, you see hot colors in the beta regime and they're separated when the mouse started trembling, which is something that um, P PD sufferers do. So there were a lot of high fives around. And um, we, uh, so, so Shua Han, when she got her own faculty position, she redid this experiment in uh, a better way and more sophisticated way in which the rats could, the mice could run around uh, freely and the cells that produce acetylcholine were activated with optogenetics. And she found once again, all the beta that we expected. And she also found that these mice exhibited all of the symptoms, all the motor symptoms of um, Parkinson's disease. So we were really happy with this. And um, when you have a new idea about something, it leads you to other new ideas. So it's led us to new ideas about mechanisms of deep brain stimulation, and we're working on that now. Uh, we have the paper almost finished, which is very different from everybody else's mechanisms. Okay, there are other diseases that are um, almost done. Um, there are other diseases that are tied to pathological brain dynamics. I don't want to go into them in any detail. Um, Helen Mayberg has been looking at depression and um, uh, showing that deep brain stimulation also works for depression. Uh, Li Wei Tsai has been showing that mice that are given um, that are shown sensory inputs, uh, given sensory inputs with 40 hertz gamma, if they are, uh, they are animal models of Alzheimer's, various things about Alzheimer's change for the better, the plaques go away, the co cognitive um, behavior becomes better, and she's now starting to work with human beings. To Cal Hench, is looking at developmental diseases, um, including autism and schizophrenia, and showing that rhythms are really important in those things and can change the, the way in which the, um, the disease progresses. So one reason rhythms are connected with disease is that there, there can be pathological plasticity. Plasticity is known to depend on the timing of spikes, and the timing of spikes is dependent on rhythms. So if something bad happens to rhythms, it's likely to mess up plasticity, which will mess up everything that comes after it. So uh, Takao has also shown that rhythms are important in the critical period of learning. And in my final, final, I don't know if you see these. In my, in my final um, example, I want to talk about a man-made kind of disease. That is, if you give people or animals anesthesia, you can put them into a coma. And when, that, when, when you administer anesthetics, all brain rhythms in all anesthetics change in massive ways that are highly reproducible. So what I'm telling you in the next couple of slides is part of an ongoing project with Emory Brown. And um, it's really a good way to think about brain rhythms and any kind of cognition because it helps us make the link between what's happening at a physiological or, or um, uh, other local cellular level to what happens at a high level like thinking. So the work is separating out this big question, how do you get from the lowest effects of anything to the highest effects? 
and it's separating it into two questions. The first is how do the physiological effects, how do the physiological effects um, affect brain rhythms, which depends on the anesthetic and the dose. And then once you know that, how do changes in rhythms affect the loss of consciousness? Okay. I'm gonna very briefly, one slide each, talk about two different anesthetics that are totally different. Uh, one is called propofol, which is sometimes called milk of amnesia, because it's a kind of milky white. And this one acts locally by increasing the effects of inhibition, but it doesn't just stop the activity of all of the cells. In fact, what really happens at loss of at loss of consciousness, which this is measuring here in human subjects, they're volunteers, by the way, is that uh, there's a big change in some of the rhythms. So this again is a spectrogram in which we're seeing the hot colors. This is frequency, this is time. The hot colors are representing when there's more of something. And what we're seeing is that when there's a loss of consciousness about here, then suddenly there's a lot more alpha and there's also this low frequency that's less than one hertz. And one interesting um, thing here is that those two different rhythms are not independent. So I showed you on an earlier slide the way a gamma rhythm could be embedded in this slower theta rhythm. And here the alpha rhythm is embedded in the slower slow rhythm. But what's even more surprising here is that the relationship between the alpha and the slow rhythm changes over the course of the anesthesia. And so, at the very beginning, at the loss of consciousness or return of consciousness, um, the alpha is mainly in the, in the lower part of when there's less of the deep rhythm. You see that in both of these. And when, when the subject is really, really out, then the alpha is actually in the higher parts. Um, in, in the peaks. And the importance of this is that it shows in real time the depth of the anesthesia. So now it's being used in the operating room and anesthesiologists are being trained in these techniques because they can see in a way that's better than any of the previous methods just how deep the anesthesia is, whether it's getting too deep or, or uh, the patient may wake up. And um, our work was in, in, in the modeling, um, two papers, one published, one in preparation, shows, um, gives a mechanistic explanation of where the shift comes from. So I now wanna talk about ketamine, which has become very famous lately because it, at low levels, at low doses, it turns out to be a very good, very fast acting antidepressant. And it's well known on the street as Special K because at low doses, it produces hallucinations. And what we see here in this spectrogram is that um, uh, when there's a low dose of ketamine, these are in humans, but it's been done in animals too. And you get the same thing. Um, that there's a lot of gamma and it just goes on. There's also a lot of some lower things. And at higher frequencies, at higher uh, doses, you still get the gamma, even more of it, in fact, but it's broken up into pieces. In a periodic way, uh, the period is um, one of these very slow ones. So, Anesthetics, these two anesthetics do change the rhythms and they change them in really different ways. They also have really different, um, they really different mechanisms, mechanisms at the low level. And this one, the ketamine, 
is thought to act by changing the ability of the so-called NMDA receptor to work. And the NMDA receptor is an important part of how excitatory input gets into a cell. So um, there's a loss of the action of NMDA receptors on inhibitory cells. So there's a loss of excitation to those cells. And it means that those cells are no longer inhibiting E cells. So there's a disinhibition and the E cells can then be merrily spiking a lot more than they normally would be. There's also an imbalance of excitation and inhibition, and it turns out with more modeling that you can see that it turns on another current that's even slower, that's responsible, we believe, with making these um, separations in which there are times when the cells are hardly firing at all, so-called downstates. Okay. So the last two slides, we're talking about how do the rhythms change? Why do the rhythms change? But the big question is, why do they cause a loss of consciousness? Why, how can we see from whatever it is that the rhythms are doing that the anesthesia should act to put a subject into coma? Well, what we see, and this is true more generally, than I've been able to show you is that anesthesia seems to work by hijacking the normal brain rhythms. They don't get rid of them. They don't suppress brain activities. What they do is make those rhythms much more rigid. So they can't respond anymore to the normal inputs that the brain is used to. They can't suddenly switch from one rhythm to another. They're more like a clock and they they just do something and just keep on doing it. So some areas become hyper-coordinated, others become uncoordinated or coordinated in the wrong way. Some rhythms that are really important um, disappear completely. There are some downstates with no activity, but the bottom line is that the change of rhythms prevents the kind of normal coordination needed for consciousness. So we can still argue about what consciousness is, but it's clear, I think, that um, um, this is giving us information about what's a necessary condition for consciousness. Okay, my last slide. The big, big picture that I was trying to sketch out here was that Cognition emerges from flexible dynamic coordination. That's what you see when, um, that's what you see rhythms doing. And the examples I gave you with gamma are examples of flexible dynamic coordination. So that if you mess up the rhythms, then you're going to get dysfunction in cognition. And so there are reasons to believe then that any alterations in rhythms are going to be common pathways for the development of disease. This doesn't mean that diseases aren't caused in some sense by, um, uh, by insults or, or by genetic abnormalities, but that those insults or abnormalities can change what the rhythms are. And that will change um, that will change what the coordination is. It will change plasticity. It will, it will change the whole course of disease. So the really big question is, is it possible, under what conditions is, is it possible that alterations in oscillations can actually restore the disease state to normal? You've seen an example from Parkinson's disease where simply changing the rhythms, getting rid of the pathological part of the beta rhythms can in fact go back to normal motor outcome and that's true of depression. Um, so we're hoping that by doing modeling 
we can understand better what the courses of diseases are and see how alterations and oscillations can restore disease states to normal. So the role of mathematics here is to provide a link between physiology and behavior and then to suggest mechanisms for the production use of brain rhythms in both health and disease. And we really hope that it can help to ameliorate uh, disease states. So I thank you again for your patience as we went through a lot of technical difficulties and I, I would be delighted to answer questions. Thank you again and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. This is Dean Susan Perkins. Um, we've gotten a bunch of really fascinating questions. Uh, before I, I jump into our first question, I did want to provide some other background. So speaking of spikes and oscillations, I was sent an outage report from Zoom and there was a huge spike in Zoom <laughs> issues at about 352. Uh, so uh, this was a system-wide problem uh, that was hitting the whole Zoom platform. And so I know a lot of our attendees struggled for a little bit to get on. I think this explains the technical difficulties you were facing. Uh, and I did wanna share with our attendees uh, two things. One is that um, the good news is because you had a, a few difficulties as well, they probably didn't miss the beginning of your talk. We started a little bit later. And uh, if you would like a copy, we do plan on sharing uh, the talk with the attendees so, um, so we can provide that. So with that, let me launch into uh, some of these questions. And I want to start with this one because I think uh, this might help uh, as a definition for some future things. And that is, uh, Thomas has asked, what is meant by plasticity when you say that? Oh, thank you. I mean that um, the connections between cells change over time. If they're, I mean, this is especially true of development, but it's even true um, in an adult state that, um, that the kind of inhibitory and excitatory connections I talked about can get stronger or weaker, that new ones can, can appear and old ones can disappear, and that rhythms play a very important role in guiding which ones will, um, which ones will increase or decrease. And they do that because whether these cells or whether these connections are going to increase or decrease depends on the timing between um, the input and when the cell actually fires. Great. Um, the next question comes from uh, one of our physics professors, Alexios Polykrakos. Um, so let me, let me, it's a okay. bit of a two-part question here and a, and a tough one. Uh, so the professor asks, I'm puzzled by the fact that rhythms, that is the peaks in the spectra, appear yeah. for short time signals, but not for longer. The Fourier transform of a part of a function is the full transform convoluted with sine of k over k. So it generally smoothens it and does not produce peaks if they weren't there already. Well, what happens is over, um, this has to do with the fact that the signal is not stationary so that um, the rhythms come and go over very short periods. And if you try to do the usual kind of Fourier transform over long periods, you're averaging over times when the rhythms are there or not there. And that's the reason that they get averaged out. Great. Um, and then our chair of biology, Dr. Jonathan Levitt, ah. has a question for you. He's a <laughs> neuroscientist. Uh, so he would like to know, how might the different rhythms in various brain circuits arise? Are they different kinetics of firing rates of cells participating in those circuits or different kinetics of the synapses linking those cells? Everything, all of the above. That is, um, different rhythms can involve different ion occurrence. Um, if the voltage is high, remember I said that there are gates that open and close um, various, um, the, the gates 
so there are there are um, gates that open and close across pieces of the cells and they depend on the voltage. So at high voltage, some currents can get through and other currents can't get through. Um, um, so you find in gamma, for example, that certain kind of currents depend on um, having low, having high voltage, well, certain kind of currents can depend on having low voltage, and if the voltage is high, these equations basically make the gate close. So you can have different ionic currents, you can, you can have gates opening and closing, um, so they, they involve different cells because um, different cells involve different ionic currents. It's basically everything that you're talking about is there in trying to understand how you can get all of those different currents. And it would have taken me, I think, the entire hour just to talk about how do you get rhythms out of Hodgkin-Huxley equations. But one really important part is the time scale of um, inhibition. Let's see, one of these things I talked about. Um, uh, I talked about the time scale of inhibition and the fact that inhibition lasts longer than excitation. And there are many different kinds of interacting um, inhibitory cells that don't have exactly the same inhibition. Um, so which inhibitory cells are involved in a given uh, cell assembly can also be very important in how you get different rhythms. The bottom line is it's really complicated and there are many books about it. <laughs> so I was only giving you, I was trying to give you a taste of this, but you have, I, it's a really wonderful question. Okay, thank you. Well, from the chair of bio to the chair of math here, Dr. Thea Pignataro asks, does this work help explain what is described as post-anesthesia dementia in some elderly patients? Ah, what a wonderful question. Um, whoops. Oh. Uh, I would say yes and no. That is, um, remember I said that in that in propofol, it's very important to know how deep uh, the anesthetics are, because if you get too deep, you can get what's called um, uh, I can't remember the name at the moment. But um, if if the anesthetic, if the propofol gets too strong, you actually can turn off a lot of the cells. And um, oh, it's called birth suppression. And um, the chances of having post-anesthetic uh, dementia is tied to whether or not you had this kind of birth suppression. So that's a reason why it's really important to be able to tell in real time, in real time, how deep the anesthetic is. And it's one reason why we're all very excited about the fact that you can tell in real time whether you need to ease up on the anesthetic to prevent the post-dementia, post-anesthetic um, post dementia. Interesting. Um, I'm going to jump to this question from uh, Muhadessa, who is coming to us from Queens College. Um, and so they want to know whether a patient who endured damage to a certain um, part of the brain or hemisphere of the brain and became disabled, do you detect changes in brain rhythms? And then this, the follow-up to that is, do those brain rhythms change during sleep, particularly in people who might have one of the, the diseases you talked about? Okay, I'm gonna start with the second one. Um, so it turns out that many anesthetic, many uh, diseases are tied to sleep problems. 
Um, so I, actually, this is part of what I'm working on now is um, different specific kinds of anesthetics, specific kinds of uh, inhibitory cells that seem to be very important in creating the, um, uh, the circadian rhythm are also important in a lot of other rhythms, in a lot of other diseases. So it's not surprising to me that uh, many diseases should have simultaneous problems in um, circadian rhythms because they share certain components of uh, certain kinds of inhibitory cells. So what else did you ask me first about? Um, about uh, lateral brain injury. And so- uh, oh, no, there, there was the first half, but I'm only talking about the second half. Right, the so the, the first part of the question was if somebody experienced, say, a brain injury, would that disrupt brain rhythms as well? Absolutely, it does. Mm -hmm. And um, um, this is part of the way that one can uh, diagnose this, the state of the brain is through the rhythms. In fact, people who are um, almost vegetative have almost no brain rhythms. And you can tell when they're starting to get better from various kinds of treatments because they start getting a beta rhythm. So you can actually see if a treatment is working by looking at whether the brain rhythms are going back to normal again. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, so we have a question from Ethan, which is, what is the relationship between deep brain stimulation and old-fashioned electroshock therapy? Oh, and the okay. <laughs> that inspired electroshock. Okay, I'll, let's see. Ketamine. Nope. I have to go back to PD. Okay, so deep brain stimulation is a high frequency stimulation in the subthalamic nucleus in general, although it's sometimes in other places. It's not clear exactly how it works, although my group is, has ideas about how it is and hope, aha, hopes to get people to um, test it. But the point about it is that it's enormously specific. If you miss the right place in STN, which is not very large, you can get all kinds of other effects other than the ones that you want. So it's really important to have uh, a surgeon who has done this many times and, and knows exactly where to put the stimulation. And the effects that, that it has are again, very specific. When you have, um, when you have transmagnetic, uh, what did this question call it? Uh, the electroshock? Uh, electroshock therapy. Okay, when you have electroshock therapy, it's very broad and it's intending to reset a lot of rhythms. So the idea is that there's something that's keeping some rhythm going and going and going and going. It's that kind of rigidity that I was talking about. And you can't get out of it. So you just give the brain a huge whack and um, it allows the normal rhythms to come out again. Um, electroshock therapy only goes on for a very brief period of time. To be, to, to really work, um, uh, the, the deep brain stimulation has to keep going. If you turn off the stimulator, the, prob the motor problems will return. It's, it's true with electroshock therapy that the problems can return and um, it may not be permanent and you may have to go through it many times. But the point is you get a very brief shock that gets you out of a state that the brain can't get out of by itself. And that's, so that's very different from something that has to be ongoing. 
Great, thanks. And I think while we're on this slide, it might make sense to ask you a question from uh, Leonard Akonsky, uh, who just asked, does the gabapentin repress the excitation? You know, I should know this because, uh, but I've forgotten exactly how gabapentin works. So I can't answer that question. <laughs> we'll forgive you for that. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll jump to, a, to another uh, uh, more quantitative one. So uh, Dave Rumshinsky asked, you didn't talk about the diffusive term in the Hodgkin-Huxley equations and what role that plays. Uh, why is D uniform? And why D? Okay. Let's get to the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. So that's a very good question. And the reason D is a constant is only because I'm writing down a simplified version of the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. There's no reason why that D has to be, um, why that diffusion term has to be constant and generally isn't. And in fact, um, very few people solve the Hodgkin-Huxley equation as a partial differential equation. In general, what they do is they break up the cell into what's known as compartments. And then two compartments that are next to one another are connected electrically by models of gap junctions. And those connections can be different from one part of the cell to a different part of the cell. So if you want to look at the dendrites, which spread out in space, uh, you can have a series of compartments connecting to one another and different um, diffusivities between those compartments. So you're absolutely right about that. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit on you and ask a question from Rashida. So she asks if you foresee yourself ever partnering with a sociologist to study the impact of technology on cognition and dysfunction. Well, it wasn't something that occurred to me, but um, I think the questioner is absolutely right. And the next talk, Zoom talk that I'm giving is in that spirit. It's in, a, it's in a conference that's all about inventing new technology, which I don't do at all. But I work with people who invent new technology. And I was invited to inspire some of the people who, who are doing this new technology. So in this talk, I was telling you about relatively simple, too simple, um, cases to get a flavor of, of how the rhythms come about and um, why they're important and uh, this big picture. But in that talk, what I'm gonna be doing is getting down to really complicated situations in which you have a half a dozen different frequencies all working together in at least four different parts of the brain in which you need to know all kinds of things about, uh, about how the cells are spiking and when and the coordination of all of these places. These are things that we can't measure now but we can measure in the future if people are inspired <laughs> to create the physique, to, to create the technology that we're gonna need. The technology is building enormously fast now, but so is our understanding of the depth of the issues that, um, Let's see, there was this picture I showed you about here. This is raising enormous numbers of issues about the coordination of all of these different rhythms, just when you, you think you're sitting there memorizing something. Uh, we will have to get far more precise measurements than we have now. And so 
it's going to take the building of technology we don't have now. And it's going to take the technologists understanding enough about the modeling that they really see the need for doing this. And this is part of the reason that I talked about the issue of the sociology of cognition, the sociology, excuse me, the sociology of science, because so much of science is little silos of people looking at the things they look at. And it's gonna be important that we learn each other's fields enough that we can see bigger pictures than what we're doing. And how that can happen may depend on sociologists. Absolutely. Actually, I, when I was introducing you, I, I was comparing you a bit to, to Sharon Cosley, who our lectureship is, is honoring because she, as a microbiologist, of course, was, was very multidisciplinary. And um, I think that, that you're right. This is how we need to, to leap forward in, in techniques here. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions because I think you could do them in one. Um, hey, Zeus and then Nancy are both asking questions about the effects of drugs. So hey, Zeus was specifically raising um, about some of the long term effects that drugs like cocaine, for example, can have on yeah. behavior cognition. And then Nancy brought up psychotropic drugs like sapraxia or other things that are used to treat schizophrenia. Right. Well, I would go back to saying that um, what happens when you take these drugs is that uh, you're changing what the cell assemblies are. For instance, if you're taking street drugs for the purpose of uh, producing hallucinations, so you see the world in a different way, you're activating together uh, various cells that don't normally act together and you're changing via those cells that act together, you're changing the plasticity, you're changing the connectivity of those cells. And so um, when the drug wears off, you are not really the same person you were before. You've had different experiences, those experiences show, show up in the structure of your brain. And Often they're not good for <laughs> the normal kinds of things that you want to be doing. So I could say some technical things about those particular drugs, but I think in the end, the answer is <clears throat> that drugs end up changing your brain. And um, you might want to take that into consideration when you decide whether or not to take those drugs. Okay, we're just going to do one more question, um, and this is from Shoshendu Chatterjee in our math department, uh, who asks, so you talked about you have different rhythms for patients with different diseases. Could this be used as a diagnostic? Is it being used as a diagnostic? For absolutely it is. Um, absolutely it could be, but we probably, I mean, it is to some extent. The reason I'm hedging about it is often the changes that one sees in the rhythms are not specific enough. And it could be because we're not looking in enough places, we're not looking specifically enough at the rhythms, we're not looking at coordination among different parts of the brain um, in those um, when, when you have those changes in rhythms. So we may be looking at things that are just not enough to specify what the disease is. And this is part of why modeling, I think, is so important because it can say not only does the rhythm change from A to B, but it changes in these specific ways. It changes coordination in these specific ways. These are things you can go and look for in these specific places. And it can add a lot more detail to what we can see from the brain rhythms. 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna lie for a second because I actually had a question I wanted to ask you. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. As a microbiologist, I mainly study malaria, but I've also uh, been delving into issues with microbiome, and of course, one of the big hot topics is is the effect of the gut microbiome on on the brain, the gut brain axis. Uh huh. And know that some microbes produce acetylcholine right as well as serotonin and other transmitters what's the possible role of of our microbiomes in these brain rhythms and and instead of shocking people or doing deep brain stimulation do we need a probiotic well i don't think that's out of the question at all uh, one of the interneurons that I'm most interested in is one that, that comes from, that, that was first discovered in the gut. It's called um, VIP, um, vasoactive intestinal peptide positive cells. Mm -hmm. So this vasoactive intestinal peptide was discovered in the gut. It was... Um, it turns out to play, I believe, very interesting and complicated roles, both in health and disease. Um, I think it's really important in why this Alzheimer treatment works. Um, we know that there are important gut-brain connections, partly through the vagal nerve. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there turns out to be ways to change things in the gut that will have consequences in the brain. But um, at the moment, it's still airware. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Might it happen? Sure. Great. Well, Dr. Capel, let me first thank you on behalf of the Division of Science for being a wonderful speaker and, and for showing such grace as we were all dealing with some technical issues here. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to President Boudreaux for a final goodbye. It was a great pleasure to listen to the presentation. I'm a, um, a political scientist. Uh, science was very compelling and, and quite interesting. And I think it, it absolutely meets the, the, the standard uh, that I described early on before the game that really structures this whole lecture series, which is making cutting edge science available to the broadest possible audience. So I, I want to thank um, deeply from City College for, for the time uh, that you spent with us and, and, and um, your, your generosity in sharing and your ideas. I would like once more to thank our great benefactor, Ed Blank, for his support of this lecture and his continuing for the college in myriad other ways, including his long service as a, as a member of the 21st Century Foundation Board and now the Foundation College Board. Um, thank all of you for attending the fifth <laughs> annual Sharon Cosline Ed Blank family uh, uh, science lectureship, um, and we hope to see you all next year um, when 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 we all meet again. Hopefully, in be safe, um, be happy, and um, take care of yourselves. Thank you all. Thank you all.